Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I'm happy to have you here as always. So much of the content that I create here on my channel is educational, not only for the licensed nurse practitioner, but of course for nurse practitioner students as well. And as you may know, I have completed multiple different nurse practitioner boards review in the past, uh, some here on YouTube, and then I've also collaborated with Archer in the past. And I'm just back at it again, delivering you the content you need to know to pass your boards and trying to stay at that most affordable price possible. So this time I'm delivering my content here on YouTube and on Patreon. For today's lecture, we're going to be talking all about dermatology for the AANP and the ANCC exam. However, this video is a shortened version. To get access to the complete video and the complete audio files for the nurse practitioner licensing exam, then make sure to follow the link in the description box below and that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course launches on February 27th, in which case you pay a monthly access fee. Of course though, please enjoy this free video to help you study and then to access those complete audio files, make sure you become a Patreon and join my tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, the complete course does not launch until February 27th. I just wanna make sure to give you guys a sneak peek of what's to come. So without further delay though, let's just get into dermatology for the NP boards exam. All right, so let's talk about diagnosing and treating both dog and cat bites. So dog bites account for about 90% of animal bites and cat bites account for almost the other 10% of animal bites. However, cat bites are more associated with bacterial infection. And I can definitely say anecdotally, in practice, I see a lot more infected cat bites than I do dog bites. Pasteurella is a gram-negative bacteria found in about 50% of dog bites and about 75% of cat bite wounds. Generally, bite wounds, they're left open to heal by secondary intention. This is opposed to primary intention, which means like suturing. And these wounds, they should be irrigated copiously, dressed, and then evaluated daily for signs of infection. So, of course, that's going to be an important education point for your patients, educating on what signs and symptoms to look out for that would indicate that the wound is becoming infected. So, redness, warmth, swelling, drainage, pus, all of those things are stuff that they would want to look out for. So, according to the literature, primary closure or suturing would be a reasonable alternative for simple lacerations due to dog bites on the face, trunk, arms or legs or for lacerations caused by cat bites to the face and only if they're clinically uninfected and ideally less than 24 hours old if it's a facial laceration or less than 12 hours old anywhere other than the face. So you can see that it's really important that we take into account cosmetics. So with the face it's appropriate to do cat or dog bite wounds Cat bite though, we have even a smaller time frame of less than 12 hours old, and then it was less than 24 with dogs. And again, that's just because of the emphasis on cosmetics, but those wounds will have to be very, very closely monitored. Antibiotic prophylaxis is suggested for all patients that undergo primary closure of either a dog or a cat bite, and they should have the wound checked at 24 to 48 hours to assess for signs of infection. Uh, other indications for antibiotic prophylaxis with, with uh, animal bites would be wounds on the hand or face, genital area, wounds in close proximity to a bone or joint, wounds in the area of underlying venous compromise if the patient themselves is in, immunocompromised and that includes diabetes, uh, deep puncture wounds or lacerations, especially if it's due, again, to cat bites, and then wounds that are associated with a crush injury. The preferred antibiotic agent for the prevention of infection due to an animal bite wound is amoxicillin with clavulanate, also known as Augmentin. Um, if the patient has allergies, then backup options include either doxycycline, Bactrim, or levofloxacin, plus metronidazole or clindamycin. And so it's a lot of antibiotics. 
Tell them to have something on their stomach and maybe take a probiotic. Uh, tetanus immunization, this should be determined and updated if it's needed. Uh, animal bites are considered very a uh, tetanus prone wound. Generally, tetanus is indicated every five years with an injury. So if it's not been within five years, then they should get the tetanus as well. Also, bites, scratches, contact with animal saliva can transmit rabies. And so for any bites that could potentially um, occur from a rabid animal, early vigorous cleaning with soap and water is so important. Use of an antiseptic such as iodine is also very important in addition to timely administration of the rabies vaccine series. And so, for example, I work in the urgent care, and I've seen this a few times where they were unsure if the animal was vaccinated. We don't have, it's actually a series of vaccines, and we don't have it there, but our local ER does. And most of the time, I believe local health departments do as well. So if, that, if you're ever in that circumstance in practice, have them you know, call the ER ahead of time or call the health department ahead of time and make sure that they have it, but they definitely want to get that rabies vaccine series if there's any potential for a uh, rabid animal. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about tick bites and Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disease in the United States. It's caused by the species in the spirochete family Borreliaceae. I'm sure that's not how you say it, but most infections with this Borrelia species, including Lyme disease, are transmitted to humans by a bite from an ixode tick in the nymphal stage. So that's just important to identify, identifying that's the correct tick. And so we'll talk about this a little bit. So ticks have three stages in their life cycle, larva, nymph, and adult. Lyme disease is most commonly transmitted by ticks in the nymph phase, and they're typically the most active during the late spring and early summer. So nymphal ixode ticks, they're typically tiny. They're very, very, very small and round, about the size of a poppy seed before, of course, they've been feeding. While they are feeding, uh, they become firmly attached to the person's skin. So if the tick is you know, found walking around the skin surface or if it's easy to just pick them off or flick them off, then the tick has not started feeding because once it starts feeding, it attaches and it is very difficult to get them to, de to detach. And the, the point of this is that if they, haven't start, if they haven't attached, then they're not even capable of transmitting Lyme disease. And so that'll be an important education point for your, pa uh, your patients. You can put their mind at ease if they just happen to see a, a tick crawl you know, across their foot. If it's not embedded, then it's not possible that, uh, to transmit that disease. As those feeding ticks become engorged with blood, they release their saliva into the bite wound. Studies have found, though, that the spirochetes, they're not found in the tick's saliva until about 48, after, 48 hours after they start feeding. And so this is how they've kind of determined this antibiotic prophylaxis that we use um, when determining, you know, when to give antibiotics with tick bites. So antibiotic prophylaxis, this is indicated for non-pregnant adults and children residing in highly endemic areas who meet all of the following criteria. So one, the attached tick is identified as an adult or a nymphal scapularis tick or a deer tick. Two, it's estimated to have been attached for 36 hours or greater based on either the degree of engorgement or the time of exposure. And then three, prophylaxis is begun within 72 hours of the tick removal. If they meet those criteria, then antibiotic prophylaxis with a single dose of doxycycline is indicated. Lyme disease, this can generally be divided into three phases early localized, early disseminated, and then late disease. Early localized disease, so this includes erythema migrans and nonspecific symptoms that resemble just like some sort of virus. Erythema migrans, this occurs in about 80% of patients. However, it's usually within one month following the tick bite. And it's not generally painful. However, it's sometimes patients will report that it either has a slight burn or itch and may be hot to the touch. During the first few days though when that erythema migraine lesion appears, it actually can appear more uniformly red, not that like bullseye target that we expect. And then once that lesion starts to expand and the central clearing develops, then we get that like, you know, that textbook bullseye appearance that you expect with erythema migraines. 
For patients that present with either that skin finding the erythema migrans or symptoms of Lyme disease, uh, doxycycline is first line compared to the prophylactic one-time dose. They take this for 10 days of therapy.